Kid six, chapter two, test review day one, right? Uh, this test is given over two days, so you'll take the test day one on Tuesday, day two on Thursday. Um, day one consists of five problems, though one of the problems does have an A, B, C with three problems on it, you know, so it's not really cut and dry five problems and six problems. A calculator is not permitted on day one. And you really don't need it, except for there's one part with some fractions, maybe getting a common denominator, but that's okay. You can do that without a calculator. Day two consists of six problems and two bonus questions. A calculator will be permitted that day, but I, you'll only use it on two problems. So when we go through the review, I'll tell you which two, and when I pass the test out, I'll have you circle those two. Okay? So here we go. Number one, so I kind of split this up on this slide. I at first was like, choose a problem, but then I was like, you know what? Let me assign each period so that since I knew I wasn't going to be here for you guys to pick them, I thought that was maybe the smarter way to do it. So for you guys, um, you're down here. You are given this piecewise function. If you could just do me a favor, though, could you put an equal sign right here as well so that it's less than or equal to 10? And part A says, is F continuous at the indicated value? Well, in order to determine if F is continuous, it means from the left and from the right, they have to be the same number. Okay? But if they're different numbers, then it's not going to be continuous there. So what you want to do, and, and this is asking at X equals 6, you're going to plug a 6 into both parts of this and see if they're the same number. Okay? So let's see. For the first one, we have f of 6 is going to be the square root of 54 plus 27, which is the square root of 81, which is 9. Okay. And then when we find f of 6 in the other function, we get 6 times 6, which is 36, minus 2, which is 34. So these are different, right? Since they're different, it is not continuous. However, if it would have said the first one is 9, the second one is 9, Yes, it is continuous, okay? All right, then the second question, part B says, find the average rate of change. And that's really the calculus piece of this is, do you know what these words mean? An average rate of change means slope. That means in order to find slope, I need two points. And the two x values that are given are negative 3 and 10. So then we go from here, we plug the negative 3 into the first one, which is negative 27 plus 27, which is 0. Square root of 0 is 0. And then we plug the 10 into the second one. This gives us 60 minus 2, and 60 minus 2 is 58. So I have 58 minus 0 over 10 minus negative 3, which is 58 13. If you can, whoops, if you can reduce that, you want to, uh, but the fact that one of them's even, one of them's not, you know, it, it, it probably, you know, does not reduce it. So what do you think about number one? Can you do number one? All right, now when the copies were made, two pages of your document were left off. The one had questions two and three, and the other one had eight and nine, and I, ever, I think it was eight and nine. And so I already gave you eight and nine. All right, so here is number two. All right, so you could just write it in there somewhere. This is saying the limit as x approaches positive infinity and negative infinity is negative 4. So both the left and right sides are approaching a y value of negative 4. Then over here, this one's saying as it approaches 2 from the left is negative infinity, and 2 from the right is positive infinity. So I'll give you a minute to write those down there. So the first two are saying the right side approaches negative 4, 
the left side approaches in negative 4. Now, the y value of negative 4, when it's approaching like that, is talking about a horizontal asymptote down at negative 4. What we don't know is if these are coming from up here, down like this towards it, or whether it's coming from down here, up like this towards it. Same with this side. You know, you're not real sure what's happening, whether it's coming from above or below. You don't find that out until you read the second part. The second part is talking about when it reaches 2. All right, well, here's 2 right here. As x approaches 2 from the left side, it says it's going down. And as it's approaching 2 from the right side, it says it's going up. So this right side right here, if I want to take and connect this with the other part, it's probably that right there, which means I can erase this part. And for this one here, I can probably do something like this, you know, connecting them sort of thing. So you definitely, that's where pencil comes in, very handy on these. Just write lightly when you're not sure which side. And then once you read the other part, then you'll understand where it's coming. So you're building the graph is what you're doing based on the information that's given to you. Okay? Questions? So since you don't have the other classes for this one, just know when I put th these online, they'll all be there. You know, so you can just look at that. Even the same for 8 and 9, I guess. All right, now the next one. We're going to do number 6, we're going to do number 13, and we're going to do number 15 for your class. So I've already done 4, 5, 11, 12, 15, and 16 in the other classes. So I'm trying to pick the ones that I haven't done yet so that, you know, by the time you watch all the videos, if you would do such a thing. Uh, has anybody ever watched all the videos when I did the poll? Really? Good for you. I didn't know if you did or not. You know, I tape these things, and I don't ever go in to see how many people view them. So, well, good. Then I'm doing the right thing. Okay. All right. So for this one right here, um, it says um, as X approaches, uh, or, sorry, number six, the limit as X approaches one. And this here says, it has a little plus sign right there. That's saying from the right side. Okay, of x squared minus 9 over x squared plus 2x minus 3. So the problem here is, is if you plug a 1 into this, you get 1 plus 2 minus 3, which is 0 in the denominator, and we can't divide by 0. So for this one here, what you really need to do is you need to take um, and factor this, x minus 3x plus 3. And then I have uh, x plus 3 and x minus 1. So right here, we cancel those. When we cancel something, that means there's a hole in the graph. It doesn't mean there's an asymptote. So now when I plug a 1 in, it doesn't matter whether it's from the right or left, they're both going to go to the same place. Okay? But for this, you know, it still has that in there. So watch what happens now. When I do limit as x approaches 1, whether it's from the right or left isn't going to matter, of x minus 3, oh yeah, it does, x minus 1, because look, there's a whole, there is a vertical asymptote at x equals 1. So now I want to know from the right side and from the left side. So here's what I do. I plug in a number just below 1 and a number just above 1. I look at both sides, even though it's only asking me for the right side. And then from there, I take and determine. One of them is usually going to positive infinity, the other to negative infinity. So when you get a positive number, that side's going to positive infinity. When you get a negative number, that's going to negative infinity. If they're both going to positive numbers, kind of thing, you know, then that would maybe mean they're both going, you know, up in the middle, sort of thing. Um, so, anyways, there's a vertical asymptote at x equals 1, so I can't just plug a 1 in. And so let me plug in like uh, 1, since it's from the right side, let me plug in like 1.1 when x equals 1.1. That would be on the right side of it. So we get 1.1 minus 3 over 1.1 minus 1, which is negative 1.9 over uh, 0.1 or negative 19. That means it's going to negative infinity. But if it would be a positive number, that means it's going to positive infinity. And so the limit of this right here 
on the right side is going. So this, this in other words, is saying at x equals 1, there's an asymptote. On the right side, it's going down like this. That's what it's saying. Where notice these others did not have the left or right side. And so for these right here, you just plug the number in. You know, it's, it's saying, you know, there's, they're not different on the left and right side. They're the same. All right, so that's number six. Next, we have number 13, which let me rewrite it down here so that we have some space. Limit as x approaches in, <coughs> excuse me, infinity, square root of x squared minus... 9 over 2x minus 6. All right. So for this one right here, if we, we, well, we can't plug infinity in, can we? So instead, we take a different route. And you might remember, whenever it's going to positive or negative infinity, that's when we take and we start dividing by the highest exponent in the denominator. All right. So in the denominator, it's going to be 2x over x minus 6 over x. But in the numerator, under the square root, an x under a square root is an x squared. So this is x squared divided by x squared, and this is minus 9 over x squared. All right, so then from there, x squared over x squared is 1. So I have 1 minus. Now, um, I still have 9 over x squared here. Down here, I have 2 minus 6 over x. Remember, whenever you have a number over x, x squared, x cubed, any of those, those approach 0 when you plug a very large number like infinity in. So now I'm plugging the infinity in. When I do, I get the square root of 1 minus 0 over 2 minus 0. So this here, the square root of 1 is 1 over 2, so my limit is 1. I feel like it's been a long time since we've done one of those. We've done some other things since. All that, you know, the definition of derivative with, a, you know, n of x plus h minus f of x over h stuff. So, okay. Questions on that one? So once you can get these written as a number over an x and x squared x cubed, then they just go to zero. You know, that's what they approach. All right. And then this other one, I think I can just do right here. Um, it is a piecewise function that has three parts. It has a line, a parabola, and then the square root function with like the little arm that pops over. And here are some limits that are asked. Now these on the top, so this is 5 from the right side, 5 from the left side. This is 8 from the right side and 8 from the left side. I know those are kind of hard to read. These are both 5 though. All right. So it says 5 from the right side and 5 from the left side. Notice that both of these are defined around 5. Since x is less than 5 here, this one refers to the left side of 5. And since this is greater than 5, this is the right side of 5. So when I want the right side of 5, I'm going to take this one and I'm going to plug a 5 in. 5 plus 1 is 6. 6 squared is 36. 5 from the left side, I'm going to use this one. 2 times 5. So these are quick and easy, as long as you can read and you understand left and right, okay? You can read limit notation. So here, these two are both defined with the 8. This is the left side, this is the right side. So 8 from the right side is using this one. Square root of 8 plus 1 is the square root of 9, which is 3. And then 8 from the left side, 8 plus 1 is 9. 9 squared is 81. So can you read limit notation? Because that's what a derivative is, is a limit. Right. So you can see we've done a lot with limits in this chapter. Question on that one. So that's the one, that even though it's like labeled on the test as number three, it has a part A, B, and C. Okay. All right, next, number four. Use the epsilon delta definition of a limit to prove that. And you guys have this one right here. All right. So this proof, I think, is like, I don't know, 10 points, I want to say. It's whatever it was on the quiz, I think it's the same on the test. Um, one thing that some of you left off in the very first step is the very first line. 
let epsilon be greater than zero and delta be greater than zero. This is giving two pieces of information, so it was worth two points. So if you left that off, you got two points marked up. So I just wanted to make sure and say something today so that you, you know, um, don't forget that. Because that's an easy two points, okay? Then next, we start with the x right here. And we say, if um, absolute value of x minus 12 is less than delta. Now, you could have this greater than 0 as well or not. This part here, I don't care as you have, if you have, because you have it right here as well. Okay, so I'll take it either way. It doesn't matter. Then, and then we take these things right here. Absolute value of 3x minus 1 minus 35 is less than epsilon. And then you work with this right side. You combine your like terms. You factor out any number. So these are both divisible by 3. Now in the take-home quiz, they were both divisible by negative 5. So when you pull it out, it's like absolute value of the number times the absolute value of what's left. So on the take-home quiz, it was absolute value of negative 5, which changed to positive 5. Okay, so on this one, you really don't have to include that because it is positive, but some of you might have missed a point on the take-home because of that. So then this becomes um, absolute value of x minus 12 is less than epsilon over 3. Now, my goal was to try to get it written to the same as this one over here. And then once I do, I take and say, okay, well, that means the right sides must be equal. So delta must equal epsilon over 3. Okay, that's part 1. Part two, then, is taking and starting with this step. You can't start with any other step. You have to go all the way back to that original step. And I know that it seems redundant. I agree with you 100%. Okay, but we have to formally do the proof correctly. So we have to include it. So this is the same thing as 3x minus 36, which is the same thing as 3 times x minus 12. And x minus 12 is less than delta. So we say this three times in place of the de this, I put a delta, but I use a less than in front of it. So it's like less than that three times delta. And then in place of delta, I plug this in, which is equal to three times epsilon over three, which boop, boop, is epsilon. And I mean, I didn't see a problem with the work. Like all of you understood you needed to get the epsilon. It's just that some of you, like, started here instead of there. And I know that seems really finicky, but it's just writing a proper proof. Okay? I don't want to teach you wrong. I don't want to teach you to be lazy. So that was my least favorite section to teach, but now that we look back at the problems, that might not necessarily be the toughest problem because I am going to give you one that's linear, that's to the first power. So it's, it's just this format. So, you, can, you know, you can memorize that format. But when I had to teach you all the different parts to it, there were a lot of pieces parts, you know. But I decided to be nice and only give you that to the first power rather than one with squared that you had to worry about C and all of that. So I thought, if you can do that, then I'm happy. And then the last one for today that we have to go over is this one right here. Let me, in fact, write it down here. Okay, so this says find the slope of f of x at x equals 3. Now, we know the slope is the same thing of the, as that limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. You have two options right now, but there is one that might be a little bit safer for you than the other, okay? Like, for example, you know that the x value is 3, so you could plug the 3 in and get what that is, and then you could have 3 plus h for your second x value, plug it in kind of thing. Or you could plug in x and x plus h. I will tell you that if you do it this way in part a, in part d, you're going to have to do this. If you do this in part A, then you can use it from part A in part B, and it actually saves you time. So rather than working through it twice, it is your best bet to use the X and the X plus H. Okay? I know when I was making the key, the one, you know, because there's different keys for each class, 
one time I did it with the three and the three plus h, another time with x and x plus h, but then later I had to go back and I'm like, well, no, it's not on me, you know. So I wanted to make sure and tell you guys, if you want to save yourself some time and not have to work through that nasty formula twice, just use the x and the x plus h, okay? And I'll show you what I mean. So if I plug the x in, I get x squared plus 10x minus 11. When I plug the x plus h in, I get x plus h squared plus 10 times x plus h minus 11. So now we set up for our slope, derivative, whatever you want to call it, as h approaches 0. y2 minus y1. When I square this, I get x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. Distribute the 10 plus 10x plus 10h minus 11. That's just y2. Some of you on the take-home quiz, you thought you had it all. You forgot to come up and subtract this guy. All right? So now I have to subtract y2. So minus x squared, minus 10x, and minus negative 11, which is plus 11. All divided by h. Now things should cancel very nicely for you. x squared, negative x squared, negative 10x, positive 10x, negative 11, positive 11. Everything that is left has an h. So we have the limit as h approaches 0. I'm going to factor the h out. 2x plus h plus 10 all over h. That's those h's. See you later, dude, right? So I have the limit as h approaches 0 of 2x plus h plus 10. Now plug a 0 in for the h. So I get 2x plus 10. So this means f prime of x, the derivative, is 2x plus 10. But this is saying, what is the derivative at 3? Well, that's 6 plus 10, or 16. This is the slope. You did it with the 3 and the 3 plus h? Yeah. That's fine, and you still got 16. Same, Same exact answer. Yep. But then in part d, that means you had to do this. Where if you do this in part a, then you're going to be able to use this right here in part d. You won't have to do it again. So that's fine. And I did that on at least one of the versions, and I'm like, eh, why did I do that? You know, after I did it and got to part B, then I was like, oh, you know. So, and that's fine. You know, it's, it's good practice, you know. No problem. All right. Part B then says, write the equation of the tangent line at x equals 3. Well, I need two things. I need the slope, which I just found, and then I need the point that has the x value of 3. So I do have to go back up here and find what f of 3 is to find the y value. 9 plus 30 minus 11 is 39 minus 11, which is 28. So now I use my point slope formula. y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. And stop right there. Because remember, what you would do if you tried to get y by itself is you would use both algebra and arithmetic, and those are the problems, right? You don't want that to happen. It was kind of funny, Mr. Um, Anderson came over, you know, between classes one at, at one point today, and he's like, yeah, you know, the calculus kids, whenever I tutor them, their biggest problem is algebra. And I'm like, <laughs> I say the same thing, like, every day. <laughs> right? Not the only one. Questions on that part? All right, part C then asks for the equation of the normal line. So what's that? The perpendicular to tangent. Perpendicular to tangent. So that means I need the perpendicular slope. What would the perpendicular slope be? Perfect. But still the same point, right? I, that part doesn't change. So then I take y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. And stop right there, right? Stay away from algebra and arithmetic if you, have, if you can. Now for part D. Part D says, find any points where the tangent line is horizontal. Horizontal. What do you know about horizontal? Equal zero. Right. The slope is equal to zero, which means f prime of x equals zero, right? Up here you have what f prime of x is. Just set it equal to zero. But if you used 
The other way, the 3 and the 3 plus h, you don't have f prime, you know? Yeah. So that's the difference. If not, you would have to go through this to find f prime and then set it equal to 0, which is fine. You know, if you already did it the other way, I wouldn't erase your work. Just redo it again, you know? Subtract 10 from both sides, divide by 2, and you get an x value of negative 5. But they said find the points. Points are points, right? I have to give it as a coordinate point. I can't just stop and only give the x value. A few of you stopped and only gave the x value on the take home. So, you know, for this, make sure you don't stop. Here, you got to plug it back in to the original. So the original was f of x equals x squared plus 10x minus 11. So f of negative 5 would be 25 minus 50 minus 11, which is negative 25 minus 11, which is negative 36. So this here is the point that this would have a tangent on. So that is day one of your test. It kind of breaks it down into two small tests, which I think is easier for you guys. Uh, but we only have, you know, 47 minutes in a period, where at college you have, you know, an hour and 20 minutes kind of thing. So um, you get a little extra time by having two 47-minute periods. But questions at all about tomorrow's portion of the test? Okay. Okay.